Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Danielle Crittenden. And I'm Christina Hoff Summers. And this is the last podcast before our March break. Yeah, taking a little break. Taking a little break. We're allowed. We're allowed. As women, we have to allow ourselves breaks. Your private time for ourselves. Time for facials. Because you, we need it and we deserve it. We deserve it. Yeah, it's our... Like, <laughs> So we just have to take care of ourselves. We could do so much better if we were more empowering. Do you feel our podcast isn't empowering enough? We should go a little bit, I don't know, the direction of the view. <laughs> have a lot of, I don't know, life coaches on and talk about. I listen to literally one of those um, sort of female life coaches say, it's not what's right. That's important. It's about what's true and true to you. It's all about you. But I thought, you know, there are a lot of things that are true but not right. Yeah. That was my reaction. Then I realized this is why we're going to fail as an empowering female podcast because we don't say those things. We don't say those things. We don't believe those things. No, you have to do what is right and just and fair and reasonable. And you, and you have to check your facts. And you have to step up and yeah. stop justifying everything. <laughs> Oh, all right. Exercise. Okay. No, we're getting in trouble. So you just came back from Wisconsin. Yes. I just came back from the University of Wisconsin in Madison and gave a talk. for. And I was invited by the Young America's Foundation, YAF. And, and there's a group of students there who are in the club. And they're not white Nazis, just a Sherman. No, they're the <laughs> nicest kids in the world. And they're in battled at that university. I mean, this one young woman told me that in every class and every orientation, she's five times, you know, had heard about the rape culture and the intersectional oppression. And it's just ridiculous. They're basically just cheese heads out there. Well, the thing is, we, went, we had a wonderful dinner afterwards. And wherever I go, I always like to taste the local, you know, whatever cuisine. is the special cuisine. It turned out to be cheese curds. And I was skeptical, but then they arrived. <laughs> they were fantastic. It's cheese, some kind of cheese, fried. And then you have these little cheese balls, and you take it with a fork and dip it in ranch dressing. <laughs> this sounds like, like many people's night food nightmares, but cheese curds are important to my culture, Canadian, but really Quebecois, which is not my culture, which takes cheese curds. They melt them over French fries, and that's one of the essential elements of poutine. We didn't have French fries. <laughs> no, no. You melt them with you put uh, melted cheese curds and gravy, and I think and the French gravy. and and I think they put ketchup. It's kind of disgusting. Uh, but they are Quebecois. What can I say? Uh, you, they are not the French. Uh, they are Quebecois. Oh, no, yeah, there you go. <laughs> anyway, it was wonderful, and thank you to YAF at Wisconsin because it was one just these kids inspire me, and they're no nonsense, and they're they're not far right. They're just. They have a lot of common sense, and so you get sort of mo kids that are moderate or libertarian, but they're just not buying the kooky politics on campus. Well, and now, so you're going to go to Australia yeah, with first... Roxanne Gay. I oh, know. my gosh. You're a little nervous about that. I just don't know what it's going to be like. She's blocked you on Twitter. She's blocked me on Twitter. She says strange, mean, kind of mean things about me. And she's, like, bigger than you. Yeah, I think she could beat me up. So this could be a She's younger, worldwide stronger. wrestling funding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. So you've got no a three-city debate, right? Right. Uh, well, I think it's right now, it was supposed to be three cities, but now I'm hearing it's going to be uh, in Melbourne and in Sydney. But I'll tell you all about it when I come back. Okay, I can't wait. I'll be going to Mexico City, pure vacation. You're going to Mexico City? You I didn't am. tell me. I, it's it's kind of our narcos obsession. You didn't invite me. Well, I, I, you're always invited. You're going with David, but not me. I'm going with David and my children. And not me. No, we've gone on so we've gone on so many nice vacations to Mexico. We will go we've again. We've been to Mexico. But this is going to be a kind of nerdy history Mexico City tour where we go. Remember, we once wanted to go on a cruise. It was a. Oh, I remember this. This is what I long to do, and nobody wanted to do it except you and David. <laughs> And it was a the history. World War II Pacific World War cruise, II Pacific. And, and there was with, a cruise with experts, line with with all these experts, you know, like right. soldiers, and you know who knew everything. I know, and I, I, I think I think that. we missed that. That ship has sailed. I think we missed that. But um, quickly, before we get to our amazing guest, mansplainer this mansplainer week, David Brooks, David Brooks, the New York Times. Before we bring him on, and he's going to be in studio, people, just very fast. Stories of the week. I pulled one. 
Dads can breastfeed now. <laughs> With this wearable device. There's a device? Isn't it a bottle? No. I, okay, it's, it looks like um, a man sort of straps, it's hard to describe. A man's uh, plastic. ear. Plastic. A man's ear. They had them on Seinfeld. <laughs> plastic formula filled breasts around him. And then he can have the experience of nursing the baby. Why does um, he have to have that? And it debuted, by the way, recently at South by Southwest. It resembles, I'm just reading the highlights, a woman's breast is equipped with a tank for milk or formula and a nipple. And by the way, this is very, okay, if men were design, designing breasts, guess what this does? The device also tracks the baby's sleeping and feeding and allows parents to see the data on the application. <laughs> it's like... Um, the baby had like 3.7 ounces, and that's less than they had earlier today. Did you get this from a porn site? No, I got it from uh, USA Today. Well, with, okay. Okay, they've gone all the way. They've You're, gone all the, to the dark side. <laughs> well, why is it the dark side? It's a great thing, right? The Are man, you serious? <laughs> the man can feel close to his little baby with his fake plastic milk sacks at 3 a.m. Okay, I can't help but find it repulsive. Why? Milk sacks in a device? Just give the kid a bottle and hold it. Well, it's true. The, the nipple on the device did not look a lot different from a standard bottle top nipple. You know what I realized this was probably you like? You take a bottle. <laughs> ropes. I mean, that's what it is. The that's baby's not nice. going to know. No. But maybe it's important for the men. No, it's because women, there are some resentful women that have been brought up in this school of grievance and they want him to pay and, you know, feel as oppressed as they do. And it's not oppressive to nurse a child. Oh, it's it's magic to nurse a child. No, less Actually, magical I, I, at I, 3 a.m., I'm sorry. I didn't like it. I couldn't do it. I used own formula, and I liked I, it. I think a lot of women, there are more problems than allow. But I think, you know, I'm trying to think of my own husband, and maybe he's a little retro and not of the new generation <laughs> that has, David from. <laughs> has <laughs> snugglies and things like that. Although he wore a snuggly, he did. He did to walk in the park. I didn't like a snuggly, didn't he? I thought the Aww. baby would fall out. No, no, but he, do you think this is kind of the male dog cone of shame? <laughs> Think it's, the like, cone of shame. Think it's like the cone of shame. <laughs> but the man is like, hey, I'll give the kid a bottle. Why do I have to strap on these mammary glands to me? And apparently there's even some hormones they can take to lactate. Oh, I read that. That that just seems weird and dangerous and it's not unnecessary. Right. Who's calling for this? That bitter people. No, well, I don't know if it's bitter, but it's 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 very it's just, strange. Okay, maybe it's just the free market and you just have to all right. Well, Christina, you had, before we get to our guest, you had the big Sarah Lawrence. We've been following this. By the way, Zoe is away this week. She's in Madrid. Yeah. What ditching you, us. Ditching us. Fully ditching us. And this is her story. It's about Sarah Lawrence, you know, more uh, punishing um, Sam Abrams. And they staged this coalition called the, sorry, the diaspora coalition these students staged a walkout and then they released a whole list of demands there were i think 90 of them but number three which was really interesting was the college has to provide laundry detergent no softener <laughs> it has to. It's much more reasonable than your suggestion. Not detergent. That would be crazy. No, but oh, you no, no, no. I'm sorry. It's both. It says okay. This is literally number three on their list of demands. All campus laundry rooms are to supply laundry detergent and softener on a consistent basis for all students, faculty, and staff. Now that's original. Number three. <laughs> number <laughs> three. We protested. The Vietnam War, <laughs> and then later generations, they were, you know, against apartheid in South Africa. The Sarah Lawrence students want laundry softener. Well, explain why they softener. walked off in, in this whole thing with uh, Samuel Abrams. Well, Sam Abrams, who is a, a brilliant guy and a professor at the college, wrote an op-ed, a completely reasonable op-ed, pointing out that they're that what we worry about is this politicized curriculum, that it's not even the professors that one has to worry about, but it's the um, staff. 
and, you know, the deans and the uh, dorm authorities, they are inundated with this sort of ridiculous politically correct curriculum, and they impose it on students through orientation and dormitory rules and so forth. And he just said, pointed out that... This was in an op-ed in November of the New York Times, which York he's Times. never apologized for, which is what I think they're really super mad Of course about. he shouldn't apologize. It was yeah. completely reasonable, and he wasn't even against it. He just said there should be some balance, because right. otherwise it was indoctrination. Right. Well, they take this to be, you know, that the hate speech and the patriarchy, and that in, they've they've concluded that he's racist, sexist, homophobic, and they want him punished. They want him to be brought up, his tenure to be reviewed by a committee of students. The the actual the actual committee, the diaspora coalition wants to... Wants have, to review yeah. him, along with some professors who are in, you know, the departments that they favor, the most politicized departments. Right. They're, and their demands are just so authoritarian and out of 1984. But here's what upsets me. It's not so much that they're insane students, because that's a given <laughs> at any time, but that the administration, the college president, you know, she wrote back and she wrote a letter and said that she felt very honored to receive their, you know, requests. And she's just sort of jollying them along and kind of gently pushing back here and there. But they, what they, they don't seem to understand that a professor has free expression and that right. you cannot control that and they and they they completely want to take over the curriculum they have they have among besides laundry softener they want they oh i've got it i've i've got it here and and it seems like since that november op-ed they they one of their demands is the college must also apologize for quote its refusal to protect marginalized students wounded by his op-ed and the ignorant dialogue that followed and also among the demands is that no action be taken to discipline them for this walk because <laughs> they but know it's so, it's, they know they're acting it's up so... and they know they won't be disciplined okay so here and is... the school it's like a it's the most expensive college in the and world play, well, well now we know why cuz okay cuz here are some of their demands which if met would make it even more expensive than it is so they just i think they just gave Speaking of laundry, their laundry list of everything they could possibly want in they want do they want Fitbit every no student? no but they say, okay so this is like they must Sarah Lawrence must commit to actualizing the value that no students go hungry so they want students to have access to at minimum two meals a day which must include vegetarian gluten free <laughs> vegan halal and kosher options. That was one of them. Uh, this one I didn't fully understand. It says, we demand an increase in transparency in the Office of the Dean of Studies, including how to receive a book stipend. We demand that the fund for books and internship travel stipend be increased. So I guess what? Free books and travel? We demand a mandatory first-year orientation session about intellectual elitism and classism. Intellectual elitism. Oh, and this is one of my favorites. We demand all students have access to unlimited therapy sessions through health and wellness. Well, you know what? They know and they provide transportation to the students with weekly therapy in the Westchester area. So this is... You know what? I would give them that. Really? They, yeah. Be they super think expensive. they need therapy. <laughs> I really do think they're working out personal problems. And I think a disproportionate number of young people who go to that school had pre-existing conditions of neurasthenia, <laughs> n uh, narcissism, borderline personality disorder. Well, the creepiest of these, I have to say, like they, one of their demands was that black history, any kind of Jacana history could only be taught by black professors. And then they also, in this long d list of demands, um, have that black or students of color should be housed together. And we're creating a weird kind of new segregation, right? Yeah, it's as if they think we're going to solve the problems of division in the society by dividing everybody. Right. And they're, like they're, Asian Asian professors have to treat you teach Asian history, history or, black history has to be taught by black professors. Um, and then you can just see how this all unfolds. It's just balkanizing. It's just a victimology spinning out of control. But yet the school just you know, doesn't lay down the line and set limits. And so they're acting out. But they seem so uh, immature.
Well, this leads me into my last story before we get to our guest, which from the Daily Mail, which I love. Which you love. I love it. It says they interviewed an expert who helps businesses integrate new workers, human resource person. And he says that one in three millennials do not make it through 90-day probations at new jobs. Generation Y has an incredible dropout rate. And a lot of the reasons are they just get there and things aren't what they thought they would be. There's no fabric softener. <laughs> There's no fabric softener. I would, would you hire anyone room? from Sarah Lawrence? Well, no, but I, I had this. I'm afraid of them. I, I, you know, I, I've hired millennials and let's just say that we there have are a, a lot of We have a millennial room and I just hope that... No, a lot of them are great. Okay, it says... Of the reasons for failing of these millennials, 62% is poor performance, 50% is absent, 25% is lateness, and 30% is gross misconduct. But then you 30% get into gross misconduct. Well, then you get into why, and it's it's like they just over half of the onboarding programs lasted one week or less, that they get there and they just decide, I don't like it. It's not what it was, you know, presented to me. Uh, I don't like their boss. I don't like the culture. You know what? I sympathize with them. I didn't like my first job. <laughs> yeah, but you're not a corporate person. I didn't. You know? No, I know, but I sympathize with the kids. Eh, the workplace. No, but I've had, I hired a lot of these people in my past life in, in companies and and uh, again, to stipulate, there were some awesome of them, but the awesome, and maybe this is always true, were the smallest percentage. There are a lot of people who got there, and like, if you didn't say, like, I remember my first criticism of someone, like, and it was gentle. It was like, you know, I don't like how you did this. I think we could do, or I do praise sandwiches. Like, you know, this was great, but I think we could have done this. And they just collapse. I mean, it is this culture of never having criticized, being criticized, of having fabric softener everywhere they go. Or that, did you did you let out your inner? Ink no, I wasn't. I you didn't. Were mean. I didn't throw you anything at their heads. I didn't make. I'm. I get along with the millennials, but uh, I could see if they want to work in that world that I'm not interested in, but, it, you know, where there's all these strict rules, like you have to get to work on time. I know. I, the, for, well, I had somebody I hired on his first day, literally his first day, he said he had to leave at three, you know, versus five. He thought it was okay because... No, he had to get his hair cut. And I'm like, it's your first day at work? Can you schedule your hair right, cut uh, on the weekend? Gonna, I, I think that we should be careful because I think the majority of millennials would know that, but maybe it's kids that are coming from these... I don't know. I don't know. Style. But there's a lot of not understanding. I don't even want to say corporate culture. Basics of life. showing up for it. Just life. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. So we're having David Brooks in, of course, the very famous New York Times columnist. But he's also kind of a longtime friend of us both. Yes. He's author of many number one best-selling books. His last book was The Road to Character, but he has a new book called The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. And you and I have both witnessed him over the many years we've known him go from this wonderful, sharp commentator. Bon vivant. Well, I don't know. He's not <laughs> no, really exactly. a bon vivant. But, but charming. Charming and, 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 and self-aware and thoughtful and a really awesome kind of observer of modern life, such as with Bobo's. And now he's gone on this whole spiritual sort of journey. Spiritual journey. His last two books, including the recent one that we're going to talk to him about, is about, as he subtitle says, quest for a moral life. He's someone who seems to just be always trying to better himself and it's better himself no to be a better person to be a better person as long as i've known him it's like he's never been comfortable where he is and we need to figure out why that is so let's bring him on and ask him to explain it yes Well, 
Welcome, David Brooks, to the Femsplainers. It is a pleasure to be here. We're so happy to have you, and we have given you your cho- the cocktail of choice, which is a which Manhattan. Is a- it is in Manhattan. I was t- tempted by the old-fashioned, but I decided to go with the core drink, which is in Manhattan. But see, this is your problem, David, as you write about in the book. You're always torn between I'm two always, things. You're always torn. I wanted the old-fashioned, but then yeah, I had the Manhattan. I could have gone from a little Freud. I could have gone Scotch. Life, life filled with regrets because there are too many choices. But I'll take my no girl sip and, and rate the... And uh, I, okay, have my... Yes, and it, it, it's... It, as. People know I, we make them bespoke here in the. In it the, has a it is cherry and a little yeah, bit of little, 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 little orange smoky slice. substance. Yeah, um, yeah, nice, nice Johnny Walker black. It is. You're not going to um, send it back. <laughs> no, no, I've never sent back a drink. No. I never have either. Well, it, it, going, go. We talked before you came on about how long I think I've known you, Christina. I mean, I knew David when. We were, we were all first in Manhattan, maybe maybe 30 years ago. You were living in Brooklyn. I forget where I was living. Maybe Queens. I first met David, your husband, when he was uh, at law school. So. Oh, okay. So that's right. I you have known him long. longer than I have known him. Did you go to law school, too? Unfortunately, no. Oh, you're the only person I've met in Washington. He's never <laughs> gone to law school, yes. So we've known you a long time. And I realized reading this book where you wrote about... You, you, you've become a sort of man, as the subtitle says, the quest for a moral life, that there's always been something maybe a little restless or itchy about you, that you were always looking for some sort of, hmm. I don't know, I don't want to say meaning because that sounds cliche, but is is that right? I mean, when we first met you, you were looking into more conservative Judaism, and now you're going more sort of christian but but yeah. it's been a whole a quest. life of that, a whole quest, a quest of yeah, many I wonder, levels. I wonder if that's coming from birth or I sort of attribute, I feel more attached to my college now than I did when I graduated. And I went to the University of Chicago and I studied a great books program. And what they gave you is the the depths of human experience through those great books. And once you've tasted the fine wine, it's hard to settle for the cheap stuff. Yeah. And so the world gives you a lot of cheap stuff. But once you have, you know... Homer and Tolstoy and all my professors in the back of your head, you want the deep stuff. Uh, and so my natural tendency is toward extreme superficiality. And so, uh, and I work for the newspaper business, so that's not, it doesn't always let you go deep, but it's been a lifelong struggle to get down to where I should be. Well, you said in the book, and I found this, this just popped out at me, it says, I seem to live my life as a border stalker, perpetually on the line between different worlds. Politically, not quite left, not quite right. Professionally, not quite an academic, not quite a journalist. Temperamentally, not quite a rationalist, not quite a romantic. Somebody should scream at me, make up your damn mind. So, <laughs> so is, this, is, is the second mountain, is that making up your mind a little bit? Maybe you could describe bit. the mountains and, and yeah, where sure. this has brought you? I mean, the, the core conceit is that a lot of us get out of school and we want to do what our society tells us we want to do, which is to climb that first mountain, whether it be a teacher, a lawyer, or a doctor. Uh, and have a successful career. Uh, and you need a big ego to do that. You've got to make your way in the world, build your identity, and do the things that will get you rich and famous, or at least a little better than you were. And a couple things happen. People get to the top of the mountain, or they're climbing that mountain trying to build their career, and either they achieve success and they um, find it extremely unsatisfying, which is sort of what happened to me, uh, or they fail, or something bad happens that wasn't part of the original plan, like... Um, you suffer a cancer scare or the loss of a child. And suddenly they're not on climbing that first mountain, they're down in the valley. And they realize the desires that drove them up that first mountain, the desires of the ego for money and status, are pretty small desires. And there's a better life waiting for them if they want something better, if they want to live in deep relation with other people, if they want to live in deep relationship towards some transcendent ideal. And they realize there's a second mountain ahead of them. And that's often a mountain of service. It's a mountain of building relationships. Uh, You know, Tolstoy uh, had a great first mountain. Mm -hmm. The guy wrote War and Peace and Anna Karenina, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, And yet when his brother died in middle age, he said, well, why did he live and why did he die? And then he saw a decapitation in Paris. And he um, realized that no matter what anybody said, that was wrong. And so he came to realize there's such thing as eternal truth. And what matters is not getting good book reviews. 
it's eternal truth. Wait, this is after he wrote Anna yeah, Karenina, yeah. War and Peace? Yeah, he well, he thought he was... had a pretty good handle on truth by that you, point. You would think, but he, <laughs> he suffered this deep depression. Uh, that he had to take away all the ropes and guns from his house because he was going to kill himself. Yeah. And he said, there's got to be a better life. And so he went off and had a very different kind of career second half. Uh, but a lot, I noticed that with a lot of people I meet, the wisest and most joyful people, they did their first thing. They were a banker or something like that. And then they had really something hard. And they got much deeper into themselves, much better people. And they, they then ventured off into a life of just joyful service where it's not all about self all the time. In, the, in this book, you get fed up with, or it's not enough. And so then you look for something deeper. Is this something you find in... Most people, are there a lot of people that just get so absorbed, the whole thing, just their life flashes by and they never get up, off the mountain? That could be me. <laughs> <laughs> You're still on the first mountain. Yeah. I'm on the first mountain. No, I, I, it's like, a, it's like a, a, railroad, a railroad train is going so fast. I, I'm so, I can't get caught up with today. And I just, so I, I thought, well, I have to do what David's saying, but when do I have time? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, is, it, is this a universal thing, do you think? Or, no, I think some people go through life, I don't want to get political, but I would put my president in this category. <laughs> oh, God. Who, the, the, <laughs> the ego and the need for affirmation, the need for other people's regard is, is sort of dominant through life. A lot of people are like that. But most people, I think, some, there's always tragedy and mm-hmm. there's always suffering. And in those moments of suffering, uh, Paul Tillich had a line that what suffering does is it takes you beneath what you thought was the floor of the basement of your soul and puts you and reveals a cavity below and then reveals a cavity below that. So you realize there are many deep vastness to yourself in moments of suffering that you did not know existed. And you realize only spiritual and emotional food will fill that. And that's when people say, I really got to orient my life around the depths of myself, not the shallows of myself. And the book turns around a passage from Annie Dillard, and it's a long passage, but it, it says if you follow the monsters deep down to where things are scariest, you find your illimitable ability to care. And that deep down at the bottom of us is our heart, which is the desire for fusion with another person, and our soul, the desire for fusion with the good. And once you discover the desires of the heart and soul, the desires of the ego seem like tinny. Mm-hmm. And so I, the people I meet, I met a guy who was a banker, and he was okay being a banker, um, but then something bad happened, and now he helps people get out of uh, transition out of prison. Mm-hmm. And his eyes glow when he talks about that. Or I know a guy who um, is a businessman, and but he lost his voice, uh, and he's still in business, but his business is all about being a mentor to others. It's all about service. It's not about making the money. It's not about how famous and rich can I get. And so he just lives a life of continual service. And basically the the clawing desires of the self have gone away. And he's liberated from that. You. This happened to you in 2013. That was when you m- met, you were between the two peaks, as it were. You were in the valley. Tell, tell us what happened then. Yeah, I had a great uh, first Mountain. I mean, I got to be a New York Times columnist, and, and I got to write books that did well and all that kind of stuff. And I actually remember when um, I was told each of those books was on the bestseller list, uh, it was kind of flat. I think what worldly success gives you is you get to avoid the anxieties that come with feeling like you're a failure. Mm-hmm. But there's no... So you avoid something negative. You don't have anything positive. Yeah. Uh, and so I was doing all this, and um, three things happened to me. One was inevitable, which is my kid's got older and went away to college, so they had left the house or were leaving. Uh, second was not inevitable, but it happened, which was a divorce. And third, the conservative movement, which where I'd spent most of my life, changed, was beginning to change into what it is now. And I lost a lot of my friends uh, in that moment. It was just sort of drifted away, not violent breaks, just sort of drifted away. Uh, and so suddenly I'm alone in an apartment, and uh, I, uh, I lead a life of pure workaholism. And so work is a pretty successful way to avoid any emotional, spiritual crisis. And so I say in the book, you know, if you, if you went to my apartment and you open the drawers, the drawer in the kitchen where there should be um, silverware, I had post-it notes in there. Uh, and where there should have been plates, I had envelopes and stuff like that. Because life was work. I was never entertaining. You just worked all, all the time. I worked. And then on the weekends, um, um, all my friends were work friends. So I have lunch during the week. But on the weekends, I had nothing. Did you drink? Uh, I ran. It was like it was the healthiest moment of my life. <laughs> oh my God. Good for I, you. I, I literally, I had nothing to do all weekend, nobody yeah. to talk to, so I would That's go on these kind of... mile runs. And you were in New York at this point. You had left Washington. Well, I was in both places. Yeah, that's right. And and But I eventually moved to New York just because it was easier to be a single person in New York than it is in D.C., actually, because uh, there are a lot more single people. Uh, and so 
that was sort of the bottom, and you, you sort of, I don't know, that was the valley. Well, how did you come back up? Because you met someone who becomes very important. Yeah, well, two book. things happened. The first thing that happened was um, in 2013, I uh, was invited to the home of some friends who have a, a community. They, they take in kids who have nowhere else to live and stay. And I went to their home on a, a Thursday night, and um, I just got randomly invited. And there were 40 kids, African-American kids from the D.C. area around the dinner table. And I sh- reached out to shake one kid's hand, uh, and he says, we don't shake hands here. We hug here. And it's an extended family of ki- uh, for people who have nowhere else to go. And I was li- literally just another person with nowhere else to go. And so I've, it, today's Thursday. We're speaking on a Thursday. Tonight I'm going back to the table. I've been going to the table every Thursday for five years now. And so it's a community of people in D.C. who, uh, who just put all their stuff on the table. And the kids demand, have no toleration for social distance. They just want to be in relationship with you. So wh- one of the things I learned about that, there are a couple of things I learned from being single and alone. One, freedom sucks. <laughs> that political freedom is great. <laughs> And economic freedom is pretty good, but social freedom sucks. You want to be committed to people. You want to be committed to things. And freedom is not an ocean you want to swim in. You want to, it's a river you want to get across to get to the other side. And I was unattached. I was like, I think I was 52, and I had the choices of a 22-year-old. Right. I could have done, done anything. I could have done You could have moved to Paris. You could have gone. You to... could have overdosed and nobody would have found you for three days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. There were all these great options. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so that was the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned is you can either be broken or you can be broken open. And the broken people just get, sh- the, when the, something bad happens, they get smaller and more afraid and more resentful. The broken open people get more emotional. And so I wanted to do that. The third thing I learned was that you can't get out of the valley yourself. Somebody has to reach in and pull you out. And so this community, which is called AOK, they reached in and pulled me out. And so they, they became home for me. And it was a very group of people extremely unlike myself, like a lot younger and different color of their skin and all that kind of stuff. But they've remained in a second family for me. Well, that's uh, remarkable and that you were able to change in that way and not just succumb to depression because so many people do that and they don't have the... Im- is it, a co- is it a combination of having imagination and being lucky that someone's there to help you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't want to emphasize, like, in my bad moments, I did nothing but listen to Sinead O'Connor songs. So I, <laughs> you weren't like, with the ropes and what, no, you know, I was, Tolstoy. Uh, and, you know. <laughs> no, I, but there was a lot of sad Irish music. And, uh, and, and, and the, the jogging and the work, working all the time sounds like mortification. No, oh, I wonder. Yeah, it was just something to do and. I don't know. Once you get it, did you go on Tinder or any dating sites? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you're not the generation I, I'm not for that. that. I'm not the generation. Well, for... and you also didn't take the modern female view as I'm better on my own. I'm so happy on my own. I, I like that you say like freedom. Yeah, sucks. Right. You know, yeah. and you didn't get a dog. I did not get a dog. I think that's for for a 32 year old men who live alone. They get. Oh dogs. God, yeah. my son just said he was getting a dog. Uh-oh. Oh really? Uh oh. Yeah. Uh oh. That's two cats for women. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sign. <laughs> you you find this group. You start finding meaning. But go on. Uh, well, then time passed. I spent about two years really moving my social life to New York, mm-hmm. uh, and I had a relationship there, and then had a a whole new group of friends. Well, the the day I got divorced, I ran to a friend of mine in Bethesda. And who had been through a divorce, and he said, five of the ten people you know, you, you will be your best friends in a year you do not even know yet. Hmm. That when you, some big life transition happens, suddenly your social circles are completely upended. And that happened to me, so... Did you find there were people who just didn't reach out, or is it just you didn't people, want, you, you didn't want that? You were in Well, a... some people reach out, and I, I did throw myself on my friends, and I learned that Friends like it when you throw yourself on them. If you're in a time of something, yeah, yeah. they absolutely they are val- they think it's great that you're throwing on, yourself on them because you're not troubling them. They get a chance to deepen your friendship and do some good. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm deliriously happy, um, I have a friend now who's going through some hard times, and he can throws throw himself. himself yeah. And I'm like tickled pink that he reaches out to me because we can do something together. Yeah, that's important knowledge. I mean, people don't realize that you, you think, oh, I don't want to. Put, you know, ask somebody for a favor or do anything, and when you do, it it can be a gesture of friendship, and and you become closer. And I worry that in a lot of the issues that you bring up in the book about increasing loneliness and alienation, and the American people, when you see on the news that there's 
some tragedy, you know, very generous and come forward. And it's part because they learned about it. And it's and unless you're a member of a church or a shul and every week you hear about a cause or something, you can become distant from others, the needs of people. And so you're not connected to good works and, you know, you just don't know. So there's more of that alienation. Well, you, that you start with that in the beginning of the book, that this hyper-individualism that we've become and something you used to believe in, exacerbated, I guess, by technology today, where we're less connected than maybe in any time in history. And then and then you moved. See, I keep pushing the conversation this way, you border stalker. And then you moved to going against individualism and taking on this idea of being more selfless. You wrote, you, you turned away from believing that good character does not come from individualism. And you mentioned, by the way, Running and working at the oh, gym yeah. doesn't count for character, which my husband would take great issue with. But you said good. I, I do too. That good, I, I can't do it. Good character comes from giving yourself away. So you, I'll just you met Anne. I met my who is amazing. Yes. But you would worked with her for a long time, and you that you'd been friendly, and and she helped you with this uh, your last book, The Road to Character. She, how would you describe her religiously, and then describe how the sort of courtship yeah. and how it's really brought you to this, I think, second mountain, if that's fair. Yeah, I think that was part of it. I mean, she was she's an evangelical Christian. She went to Wheaton College, uh, and she helped write uh, the chapter. And really, we were exchanging memos. Uh, about Dorothy Day and about St. Augustine. People were in my last book called The Road to Character. And so we exchanged these memos, and they became the spine, especially for those two chapters. And she's a writer, and she was then had moved down to Houston to write about immigrant policy down there for about three years, and I had moved my life to New York. But that friendship still stayed in my mind. And we had a deep connection over the memos that we exchanged back to one to Sounds another. Sounds so romantic, memos. Memos, I know. <laughs> but they were profound. They were they more were, like a discourse. They I were think a discourse. Could, like it was know. a very, I mean, it was like two people talking at a deep level to each other. And then when things changed in New York, Anne and I sort of got back into communication after losing communication. And then one thing developed into another. And um, our situation was different. And our the possibility to get married appeared. Was uh, there a Harry Met Sally moment where you just looked at each other? Moment where you realized, yeah. we've been because so, both of you were had a, obviously were madly in love, but you didn't know the other thought the same. And there must have been a moment where you realized you did think the same. Uh, yeah, there was, was it, actually that moment. Oh actually, my there was a moment. What, what, I, can you tell us? Uh, this is a bad tale of modern. I haven't thought about this. This is a tale of modern <laughs> technology. She was in Texas, and I was in San Diego for a speech or something. And we FaceTimed. FaceTime is very powerful. Oh. I actually have a friend who was in a relationship. And I think they were in a real relationship. And I said, have you FaceTimed with him? And she said, no, it's not that close a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had FaceTimed. And it was the first time we ever FaceTimed. And um, somehow looking at her there, I just think, oh, yeah, we should get married. Oh. And so it was like, um, uh, she she's an incandescent person. She just sort of glows. And even she across, is. She, I will even across you. FaceTime had that glowing sensation that, yeah, this should happen. Uh, it took her a little, took me a little persuading. She was not as quick on the spot. Well, she's also much younger. Correct. So so can I just ask you, what is that like? At We're contemporaries. Right. And restarting your life over with someone younger can be, I'm sure, exhilarating. But it can also be terrifying. Yeah, uh, so... That, it was a roadblock for both of us, obviously. Like, I don't want to die and leave her a widow. And um, I think she thought, well, it's just a big complication. Uh, I think that a couple things have to, you have to get to a certain point. And the first point is the point of the double negative. We can't not do this. You can't fall deeply in love with somebody and then, oh, I'll go with the other person. Because that other somebody is out there. And it's not fair to the, if we had married so, each somebody else, it would be not fair because we were very much in love with each other and could not stop thinking about each other by that point. The second thing is social life has to revolve around her friends. Mm. That you've got to go for the younger person's friends has to be where the core of your social life. Because it's just, I don't know why that is, but somebody gave me that advice who had sort of a, a December, May wedding or marriage, and it's turned out to be good I'm advice. And to I be like fair, you're that. like November or October. Okay. Yeah, I was I was May December, <laughs> and it was his friends. Yeah, but they were fun. Yeah, yeah. but I well, can, she, I, mean, I can we, see we, that we I can intersperse see that. with each other's friends, of course. But it can't just be because the older person has the more established social circle. 
Right. And it can't just be absorbing her into that social circle. And fortunately, I, I like all her friends very genuinely. I like her. She's got two really great best friends who are some of my best friends. So that part has worked out. But you feel like, I mean, I remember working in a office with millennials and, you know, they have the ping pong tables and the cool stuff and the scooters and the bike. And and even though I didn't think of myself as old, I was always feeling old. D- does that does that happen? No, it's awesome because we're going out to dinner and she can do this Yelp thing. And she <laughs> she's like, you're <laughs> tech support. <laughs> yeah. No, she's like. So much faster on the technology than I am. <laughs> Your kids are for that, but I guess yeah, they're... <laughs> right. right. Um, and it's, it matters that my kids were all extremely supportive and all that stuff. That that part is matter. We totally lucked out on that. But so now describe how her Christianity and her very ardent faith taught you about the second mountain, because also. And I sort of want you to talk a little bit about your childhood. That again, in this border stocking, you grew up in a Jewish household, but went to Christian schools in a Christian summer camp. Yeah. And then now you have married a fervently Christian woman, and this is kind of what, I guess, brought you out thinking about yeah. this move from individualism to selflessness, well, which is more Christian. Both Judea- Judaism and Christianity have this have just much deeper moral stories and I was I grew up in a Jewish home I did you go to uh, you went to Hebrew school I went to Hebrew school that's not always a happy story but yeah, I went no, to, nobody <laughs> like that's nobody like likes, nobody likes Hebrew every school every Tuesday and Thursday yeah. Yeah. Uh, awful uh, but uh, and but then I went to something in New York called Grace Church School and I went to a camp called Incarnation so my family was my great grandfather was kosher butcher who lived on Lower East Side I lived on Lower really? East Side and we were when it was still the, the Lower East when Side, it was still yeah. Lower East Side, and my grandfather, who really raised me very much, um, he was he was one of these Yom Kippur Jews. But we grew up in a Jewish home. And what does that mean? That means you just go to shul we on went to Yom Kippur, yeah, yeah, yeah. on, on, on holidays, on right? Right. But so, but I grew up with the stories. I grew up with Exodus. I grew up with We Survived. I grew up with like when I was a kid, the Six Day War happened, and that was. And so I grew up in this Jewish context and th- seeing a certain kind of Jewish goodness, which is to me a Shabbat dinner, a Friday night dinner table, where you've got 18 Jews sitting around a table. They're all talking all at once. They're all correcting the 17 wrong said things the other people have just said. And there's just a warmth to a Jewish Friday night dinner that is unmatched. Mm-hmm. And my line is that every Christian church service is more spiritual than every synagogue service I've been to, but every Friday night dinner is more spiritual than every church service I've ever been to. No, I so agree with that. And my, my late husband was brought up Orthodox, and he actually studied with with uh, Soloveitchik, Rev oh, yeah. Soloveitchik, Joseph. the older. Yeah. And he, I would go and visit his family, and you would, you know, they are arranged marriages, not entirely. I mean, they have choice, but they do sort of arrange the marriages and then they immediately have like 10 kids and all that all of my sister-in-laws have 10 kids but you go to the houses and it's this, this roaring family very warm singing and the, the most loving environment i i don't know how you can achieve that outside a, a you know very devout religion because it goes so counter to every other message in the culture yeah. that i but I do think having a lot of kids and having – but they keep – they able to keep the religion, the community intact by not that much connection to the outer world. So right. They, so they've know. got kosher rules. So if you live in one of those intense communities, you can't drive on Friday night and Saturday. And But they have, they have bad bridging capital, as they would say. They have really strong bonding capital. Yeah. And – but they also have – a reason for living, and they have a something they love more than life itself, which yeah. is God. Genuine and joy. I mean, that's every, as you said, every Shabbat. And but you had to go through this, and I really identified this. Was I have to say, the older I get, the less religious I become. Mm-hmm. The more strange I find religion. Uh, uh-huh. I like its traditions and its community, but you had to kind of get over that and go from the Jewish idea that doing things, being part of a community, makes you a good person, right. to the more Christian and maybe, I don't know if it's specifically evangelical idea that that you are rewarded for faith alone. And it's actually doing stuff doesn't get you a higher place in the world. So, so talk a little bit about that and how that 
really transformed your thinking a lot about getting you up this mountain. Yeah, so that's the struggle between the two faiths. I grew up in this Jewish home, but with Christian institutions, and I saw a Christian kind of good, which was a little different, which was there was a guy in my camp named Wes Wubenhorst, and he was just joyous, and he was just selfless, and he just he spoke in whistles, like because he was a permanent <laughs> child almost. Even though he did, see, he saw really hard stuff in his life. He worked in Honduras half a year and worked on domestic violence cases as an Episcopal priest, but he was never anything other than joyous. <laughs> and so I saw a sort of selfless uh, good. And in Judaism, you co-create the world. There's stuff for you to do. Jews don't think about heaven all that much because it's supposed to be perfect. So what is there to do? I mean, why bother thinking about that? Because we're there to help the arc of justice move forward. In Christians, the concept of grace is radical. It's you can't do well. God reaches in and and offers you unmerited love. And so to me, that was a struggle. How could I live a life where it's not my agency that matters? And I was torn between those two things. And most of my life, it didn't matter because I didn't believe in God. And so so there were these two philosophies. What the heck? But then... I guess over the course of a long period of my life, in my 30s, 40s, and 50s, I found my experience of life um, was wider than my conception of it. (laughs) Things were happening that seemed enchanted, that seemed spiritual, that where uh, reality overspills at boundaries. And my categories did not have any way to take into those experiences. And I have a friend named Chris Wyman, Christian Wyman, who's a poet up at Yale, who says religion is, is those moments when that seem transcendent that go away so fast and then you don't want to make those moments sort of just write them off you want to make them incorporate them into your life so religion is trying to stay faithful to those moments uh, when you things seem just not just only material they seem spiritual and so gradually more spiritual things sort of tended to happen and suddenly the possibility that human beings have souls that they have something that is eternal and dignified and infinite and that all our souls are probably connected at some level. And once you assume that people have souls, it's hard to, it's easy to come to the conclusion that there's such thing as a universal soul and a universal love, which would be God. Well, I want to believe that, but I think it would help if I microdosed. <laughs> I've been told that it might, because I've always felt I, I, I love religion. I love religious people. Mm-hmm. I feel very close to them, but I, I, I don't have the gift of faith. And someone told me I should microdose and they would expand my microdose consciousness. Microdose on what? I don't know. Like, uh, <laughs> oh, psilocybin. Oh, psilocybin. psilocybin. No, no, the new, the new psychedelics. Yeah. People, some people get to it that way. Uh, you know, it was, Did you ever try it? I never did. Okay. I always no. depend on the... The is all I've got. <laughs> uh, That's pretty uh, good. <laughs> but the, the one thing that was very comforting to me was, like, I didn't have... To, like, some people, you'd meet some especially Christians, and they say, well, God told me to order the hamburger, but then he changes his right. mind. Right, it's I'll so specific. It's so like, specific. Yeah. I'm like, nah, I don't think God talks that yeah. way. <laughs> and so what was comforting to me was to meet a group of people. Well, there's a novelist, Fred Beekner, who I've never met, but I've read his stuff, um, who says, you should wake up every morning and you say, am I going to believe all that stuff all over again? And nine times out of ten, you should say, nah, I don't believe that stuff. Yeah. But then one time out of ten, you say, well, I actually do believe it. And as he says, you should say it with great laughter. And if you can do that one t- day out of ten, that's pretty good. Um, so, but the idea that God is a permanent voice in our head is that's certainly not my experience. So it is other people. Well, it's also the Jewish idea, as relayed to me, is God speaks to people. God is a very busy man. God has multiple universes. He's right. he's managing. He's not a details man. You know, like you you know, how do you explain plane crashes and children with cancer and wars? You know, he's busy. He's a busy guy. He'll take time out to speak to Moses. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you are sitting there praying for a new car, like (laughs) not happening. Yeah. So, so, but that's not the Christian idea that they have, I guess, the personal savior of Jesus. And Jesus uh, apparently is listening to everything you say. Yeah. So that doesn't make uh, that much sense. What makes sense to me is that there's a force that's weirder than we can imagine. Like, the cosmologists say we have there are infinite numbers of universes, and one of those universes right now there's a group of people like us in this room having this exact conversation with these exact. That range. seems very weird. Yeah, God is weirder than that. <laughs> so it's I think so beyond our imagination. And but you know I'm a journalist, so I write stories, and I think the stories when I write them about people are not just random and meaningless stories. I think the people I write about 
have souls, that there, there's a dignity there, there's a depth there, there's a value there, and that there's an essential meaning to what I'm writing about. And it's not just random molecules. And that, to, when seeing I, my career doesn't make sense unless I believe the people I write about have some infinite value, each one of them. We all knew Christopher Hitchens pretty well. We all hung out with him. What do you think Christopher would say to you if he were here talking to you about your book? Yeah, he would <laughs> the say... The famous atheist. Right. I mean, we know what he would say. It's just ho- hocus pocus, show me the proof. I have a friend who said um, when my child was born, my first daughter was born, I, I found that I loved her more than evolution required. <laughs> and I've always liked that phrase because, of course, evolution plays a role in, in how we behave and who we are. But there's always an extra. And to me, evolution explains a lot. It doesn't explain why there's Shark Cathedral. It doesn't explain Abraham Lincoln in the war room. It doesn't explain Mandela coming out of prison. There, there are lots. There's an element of life that is above and beyond. And that I think is not just evolution, just people passing down their genes. And I can't give you more detail about that, but I... I just think that the the world is not a meaningless place. Did you do you remember? Um, he's probably still around. Why am I saying that? Michael Walzer. You know Michael Walzer. I don't know him, but I know of him. And he wrote a book. I think it was called um, Interpretation and in Politics, something like that. And he was writing about different traditions of social criticism. And I was reading your book at the same time that I was preparing a lecture I gave last night at the univer- or two nights ago at the University of uh, uh, Wisconsin in Madison about intersectionality and this very harsh social criticism that's just so angry at our society and, and just won't give us a break. And then I was reading your book, which is critical of society and suggesting change. But Michael Walzer made this wonderful distinction between the embedded critic, the someone who's inside the culture. And he compared him actually to the prophet Amos, Hmm. you know, telling the Jewish people, you know, reminding them to live up to their best, their finest ideals. But it was done out of love and affection rather than anger and and resentment and grievance that you get from the radical scholars. Mm-hmm. And, and your book is so much a part of the tradition of Amos as an, what he called the embedded critic that and, and it's so e- much easier to take. And you're very critical of, of the society and I was but in suggesting change. But I was reading it without going, ah, you know, when I read these angry people uh, in the in the universities. And that's what Walter said. He, he said, like Sartre and Karl Marx, they were not they did not do it out of love and affection and regard for the traditions of the society. <laughs> they did it out, burn it all down. Yeah, I find what's happened to me, of course, my life. I'm an average, very average person with above average communication skills. <laughs> and so I like what happens to me is that's happening. That's not a great epi- I mean, you can, that's not a great epitaph for you, David. <laughs> but it, I think it's rel- the reason like Bobo's in Paradise was about a time in the year 2000 where I was describing a certain culture. I was sort of in that culture. Yeah. yeah. But I could communicate it. Yeah. And so, now well. I'm in a period of I went through a period of isolation. At the same time, a lot of people in the country went through a period of isolation and alienation. Yeah. So the, the stuff that happens to the average person happens to me. And you're but able to talk. I don't have to go to you're, meetings. You are the mood ring. <laughs> <laughs> you were the no, but where, where did you learn to write? Were you? Did you write as a little boy? When I was seven, I um, read a book called Paddington the Bear. Yeah, Paddington. And I decided at that moment I wanted to be a writer. Oh, and so, it was all to Paddington. Paddington the, the most bear. influential person and, and, on your life is Paddington <laughs> the bear. And I went back, uh, actually, within five years, and I read Paddington the Bear. And it's about a, a little bear who's come from New Zealand or somewhere like that, Mm -hmm. and he's in the train station, Paddington Station in London, and he's looking for a family. And I was like, oh, I was a kid looking for... Like, what what does that say about me? And the family takes him in. That's so sweet, yes. And, um, but yeah, I was reading that book, and that's my memory. I have this section in this book about annunciation moments, those moments where you discover who you are, that prefigure everything that's going to come later. So, like... Einstein, I'm not comparing myself to Einstein, but when he was four, his dad gave him a compass, and he saw this needle moving. He saw all these, there are all these weird forces in the universe. I'm fascinated by that. So at age four, he found out what he was going to do with his life. And E.O. Wilson, I mentioned in the book, is a a great scientist who discovered um, nature when he was seven. His parents were having a divorce. They sent him to live with a family, uh, and he... uh, uh, had never seen a jellyfish before. Oh, the eye. Mm. Yeah, and uh, suddenly the jellyfish appears before him, and you think, 
this is a new world. And he's seven, and the rest of his life has been spent investigating nature. He's inspired me. I mean, he's wonderful, lovely, curious, and... He had a mentor um, who... I, yeah, who I, inspired there's a chapter, him? a chapter on what mentors do for us. And he had a mentor named Philip Darlington, who mm. was in the Amazon looking for beetles or whatever. And he was floating himself out on a log, and a crocodile came up from the bottom and grabbed him and dragged him down. Ah. He escaped. The crocodile dragged him again and dragged him down. God, it's like a parable. He got, he, <laughs> literally, he got out, bleeding all over his right side. He escaped, got himself to a hospital, life saved. And, and as Wilson said in his book, Naturalist, that's not what impressed me. What impressed me was for the next six months in a full body cast, he dragged himself out to the jungle to go continue to collect his samples. And he learned to do it one-handed because one hand was all in a cast. And he said, that's determination. And what our mentors are meant to give us is an example that something is really hard, but it's worth working for. And that's what Darlington gave to E.O. E. E. Wilson. Well, have you, do you feel that you're at the peak of your second mountain? Or I mean, you began the book. I love this because I know exactly what you mean. At the very beginning of the book, you begin with a description of people who radiate joy. And you said they are kind, tranquil, delighted by small pleasures, and grateful for the large ones. Those are often older people that we meet, I find, who have kind of got that contentment. But you, you, you do. You, it's not that you envy them, but you, you want to know the secret. Do you feel with what you've gone through since 2013 you're reaching that? No. <laughs> so I can see it. Uh, but I'm, So my newspaper column comes out every Tuesday and Friday. Yeah. And... The Times has a section at the very bottom of the webpage, most popular. And so at about 11 a.m., I, I checked to see how my column because mm. I want the status bump of being up there. That's very first mountainy. It's very first mountainy. So um, <laughs> I'm a bad boy. Uh, but so uh, I would not say I, I can see it, though, and I know people who, and there are moments. There, I, there, and by the way, sometimes when you're on your second mountain, like there, I write about a guy who adopted a bunch of foster kids. Yeah. And before he adopted them, his life was sort of a drift. Right. He said, I had, I had no traction. But taking on the heavy burden gave me traction. But you're still taking on the heavy burden. So what's your burden now? Like, how are you meeting that? Well, I do I do a couple things. I'm still involved in this AOK community. Right. And I've started this project um, called Weave, the Social Fabric Project, which where I go around the country and I meet people who are really weaving community, beautiful people. And I try to... Um, make them famous. I try to lift up their values and I try to bring them together. And so the idea is the problem of social isolation, which I felt and I think what America feels, is being solved at the local level by people who are really building community, amazing people. Right. Actually, as your, you know, pulse on the cultural trends as you've had from the beginning with Bobos, do you see this happening? Because this is, we've had a number of podcasts where this is the theme that it just comes out that, you know what, the answer is put down your phone, do something for your community. Yeah. Is, is that what you're seeing I've happening? Well, last year meeting those people. So uh, I met a woman in um, Chicago named Aisha Butler. Um, she was going to move out of the Englewood neighborhood in Chicago. And the day she was going to move out, she looked across the street and saw a lot, empty lot, with two girls throwing bottles, broken bottles at each other. And she said to her husband, we're not leaving. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be just another family who left this. And so she stayed. She Googled volunteer in Englewood, and now she runs a big community organization. And so I call them weavers. Uh, I met them everywhere now. Next week I'm going to Nebraska to meet more. And one of the things they have is vocational certitude. This is why I was put on this earth, to serve these people, to serve this place. And they're models. They're, they, they're models. It's a big decision, but I think people might get intimidated by the idea, you oh, you've got to go found an organization right. yeah. or something. Not true. That you... You just need to do one small step. Right. Well, yeah, we had a, I mean, one of the stories I tell in the book is about a woman, I think in Florida, um, a guy asked her, do you volunteer? She said, no, I do no volunteer work. I have no time for that. And he says, well, what are you doing right now? And she says, well, I'm helping the kids come out of elementary school. I just helped them across the street. And what are you doing this afternoon? Well, I'm taking some food to the hospital. Right. And so she didn't even consider that volunteering. That's just what neighbors are supposed to do. Right, yeah. And so just inviting your neighbors over for dinner is, you can count it as some heroic thing, but it's just supposed to be what neighbors do. And so... The, yeah, we have to rediscover that now. The repair of our society. Yeah. <laughs> I have one last question. 
When you were at University of Chicago, did you study with Professor Ravelstein? I, I can't remember his <laughs> Alan name. Alan Bloom. Alan Bloom, of course. I just had a blank out. I met t- temporary so, meltdown. I did not, but I would sit in on his classes. And at the beginning of the term, his kids looked like normal kids, but Bloom to- talked in this amazing way and smoked wore white shirts, black pants, these clunky back shoes. Elegant clothes, I would come back, and by the end of the term, every kid was smoking, wearing white shirts, (laughs) clunky black shoes. And then he wrote a a piece for National Review, which became The Closing of the American Mind. Right, which was huge. I saw him lecture. He was a Jordan Peterson of his time, right? right? And he he came through Toronto, and I saw him at the concert hall. Yeah, the badass. Oh, God, I loved him so much. And I loved Bellow's novel about him, although I thought he was even better than the novel. But nevertheless, Leo Strauss, like, that started But tell us about him. So I wrote a rebuttal to that piece in National Review, which became Closing the American Mind, and it ran in the school paper, and they read it as at the school chapel. And he years later, he told me, when I saw your piece, I knew my book was going to be big. Because <laughs> 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 he knew he was set off at home. And I, will, I got to know him well in the last few years of his life. He loved success. He was really a Oh, he baker. totally ate Well, I'm up. trying to bring him up because, because there was yeah. something <laughs> manic, and obviously, but exuberant yeah. and it was all oh he a, was he was a dynamic, dynamic speaker yeah. i mean the, yeah. it's modern it's the modern 19th century but he was sort of a that they could go from hall to hall and right and 1400 dollars silk shirts i mean yeah, he went for yeah. it all he and liked the it all. suites at the maurice in paris <laughs> yeah. and the, uh, he, he, these are like these are also ways to live yeah, that's David. <laughs> his second mountain. He did his first mountain first. He got all the philosophy out of the way, and, and then, then he got the shirts. And, then it was still <laughs> <laughs> and sweets at the Marine. All right, well, thank you, David. So grateful you came by. The book is The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. You can pre-order it now, coming out April 16th, right? Correct. Okay. April 16th. Thank you. Hey, Christina. Don't you love this time of year on the East Coast when... Everything is just starting to turn green. I love it. You know what else is green? You. Our BioClarity skincare products. They're plant-based, and the simple daily routines have made my skin more spring-like. Agree. I can see it. And if you haven't tried BioClarity products, now's the time to do a spring cleaning of your skin, as it were. You can save 40% on skincare routines plus an additional 15% off everything on the BioClarity website. That's an incredible deal. Yes, that's 40% off either the Skin Clear routine or for a combination of oily and breakout prone skin. Or the routine we both use, the Essentials routine for normal or dry skin. Both routines are a simple three-step regimen that comes with everything you need to nurture, hydrate, and restore your skin. The products are packed full of detoxifying and calming nutrients, antioxidants, and the super ingredient, Floralux, which comes from plants. Truly. (laughs) This is this is the anti we're for, right? Antioxidants. (laughs) And my skin has never felt more youthful. Spring like, and it's so simple. Just three steps. Cleanse, restore, hydrate. And you look lovely. You look radiant. Thank you. You too. So go to BioClarity.com and get 40% off skincare routines plus an additional 15% off everything on their website when you use the code THEMSPLAIN at checkout. Yes, it's spring cleaning time. Take this opportunity to try a rejuvenating BioClarity mask at 15% off plus 40% of skincare routines. But don't forget the code THEMSPLAIN at checkout at BioClarity.com. And if you forget, just go to our website, femsplainers.com. There we post our current sponsor deals. Well, that was so interesting. I love David. I do, too. He, he, I hope he, do you, do you find yourself, I, I feel like when I speak to someone like David, I'm like a bad person because I don't feel like I'm on a moral quest. I am like you. I'm in, maybe I'm in the first mountain. I'm just preoccupied with life. I'm satisfied with life. I'm in my children's lives and my marital life. Yeah. Do you I, feel I, an itchiness? I, to... I feel sort of like um, there was an exchange of letters between Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. And Freud thought he was being very empirical, although he, he was fantasizing as well. But Carl Jung wrote to him and said, but you haven't really accounted for this oceanic feeling we all feel. <laughs> feeling of the infinite. And then Freud wrote 
writes back and says, I'm sorry, I don't have an oceanic longing or <laughs> for the infinite. And, and I read those lines years ago, and I thought, right. I don't either, you know, I mean... I, I don't. I You know, I don't want to think I'm a more shallow person. No, but his book made me want to be a better person and to maybe, right. I, maybe get more involved than And I he am. says, he quotes uh, Franz Kafka, who said, you know, when you read a book, it should be like an axe, you know, it's hammering away at the frozen sea within. And I thought, <laughs> oh, God, I'm a frozen sea. I have but maybe to... you're not a frozen sea. I know. I'm, I'm kind of a happy little sea. <laughs> I know. We're a happy <laughs> little a garden sea. and a dog. Well, I wondered and when friends. he was talking, I had two thoughts. One was, is this a middle age thing? And could go back to Jan- Jonathan Roche, The Happiness Curve. Everyone listening, if you haven't listened to it in our first season about how life gets better as you get older. So there's a kind of middle age thing about what David was saying, that you come up to one peak and then you look across and you think, okay, well, that's nice, but I need more connection and reaching. I also think there was a little bit of a male thing that women, because we have maybe, I'm just going to make a generalization and don't bite my head off. I hope you're not going to say have children. Well, we do have children. But we have connections in ways that when David talked about being in his apartment on his own, I don't think that's the same thing for, I mean, I'm sure, look, being a divorced woman at that age would be very lonely. I don't know. But but you should probably have a circle of people and, you know, a car and and kids and connect, you know, just being busy. You're just able to, so his quest for a connection, I thought, was perhaps... A product of middle age, perhaps a product. I think it's of something different. I think that David Brooks has a rabbinical gene. And yeah, I just yeah. and I I can yeah. see it, and I think that's what he he is. There are people that are teachers, and there are there are questioners and wanderers, and he's that's his spirit, and and he's lovely. So yeah, he's and, a and, genuinely truly lovely guy and he always has been and as, and as i said when i was talking to him i think it, he's actually giving a message that people can listen to because he's not hectoring right he's not doing it from a position of superiority looking down at us all like uh, right. certainly like academics you know who want to change the world and they're angry and and outside the society chastising us all he's He's compassionate and understanding and humble. Well, I like what he said that he is, I think he sees himself as every man. Yeah. You know, that he 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 takes things, he digests things, even if he's not, quote unquote, every man. He sees it from that. It's a classic journalistic perspective, actually, where you go into something and you discover something and then you want to convey it to everybody because it has its... So he's the, he's, he's the rabbi journalist <laughs> that we all need. <laughs> all right. Well, we don't have the rabbinical journal. We don't have any time, but we'll do a quick, very quick listener top up. This is from Jeremy, who reached out to us. And I just, after our last show, remember we were talking about the inequalities between men and women and the way the world was constructed? I don't recall that. Yes, you do. I didn't consent to that. <laughs> that was non-consensual Well, remember the point about the bathrooms? That they, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. The bathrooms were not equal. And, and our headphones. The headphones in this I, I know. The, the, the were world was constructed for, like, football. for men. So he, okay, Jeremy, I don't know, Jeremy, if you're right, but I'm going to go with you. He said, with regard to restroom facilities for men and women, is it equity of space was our question. The international building code has different requirements for men and women when it comes to plumbing fixtures. <laughs> he said different occupancy types have different standards. For example, theaters are required to have one toilet per 65 females, but only one toilet per 125 males. Okay, you see? That's yes, what... yes, I think you're right. That was not in her book. Her, that's uh, right. The book we reviewed, she had an, she had an agenda, a harsh right. agenda, and she right. manipulated facts. And that's why he mansplained it, but in a good way. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. So, so I think there was maybe, you were right... Okay. You were right, honey. Thank There's you. just a little bit of... I don't want to uh, be right. I don't want to be right. <laughs> I just... I'm right about this. Okay. About lying about age, where my view was always lie up 
the big female mistake is to lie I don't, down. I'll never lie up. Never drop age, add age, and you'll always look better than you are. So Lana wrote to us and she said, funny story. My grandmother has lied about her age on every form she ever filled out throughout her life. She was born in a different country and says her father lied about her age to get her through Ellis Island. <laughs> and this kicked off a lifetime of alternative facts. Oh, that's funny. She wasn't consistent, though. This didn't matter in the pre-digital age, but it came back to bite her when she wanted to file for Social Security and Medicare. <laughs> and the agencies had different ages on file. It took a while to sort out that yeah, mess. That, that's when you... <laughs> and actually, Lana says, P.S., what's this about a season ending? Is this how you're going to force me to listen to the archives? Yes, yes, everybody, go back. Go back to season one. If you go to femsplainers.com, of course you can go to Apple, and we need you to like us, obviously. And but... yeah, People, you're not liking us enough, and we're competing with certain podcasts yeah. out there who will go unmentioned. Yeah. Evil podcasts, bad right. podcasts. And we're a positive podcast... But people, we, we need just, just you don't even have to leave a comment. Just fill out the stars. Okay, but I would say go back. Unless you're a hate all follower. of our seasons are in femsplainers dot com, and one of my favorite episodes is our very first, which is how we met and what we drank, and it sort of lays out how we came to this podcast. So yeah, we're gonna take a break for two weeks, people. So go back, listen. We'll be with you in spirit, and then we'll be back, right? Maybe if I survive Australia. Oh, no. Roxanne don't get gay. <laughs> and also all those crazy, like, spiders and snakes they there have. There are so many dangerous animals. They have more dangerous animals per square foot than so any country got to be really good. Watch out for the dingoes. Oh, yes. The, the dingoes. dingoes. <laughs> don't get my baby. <laughs> all right. Uh, see you in two weeks. Bye. Go to the archives. Bye. 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 Hey, thanks for listening to the Femsplainers. Stay with us by following us on Twitter and Facebook at Femsplainers and on Instagram at Femsplainers Podcast. You can always email questions and comments to contact at Femsplainers.com. We read every one. We are part of the E1 Network and record at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. And thanks to AEI Research Assistant Zoe Appler, who is our production assistant here in the studio, and thanks to Nat Frum, our audio and video editor, and occasional millennial mansplainer. And listen to us on pretty much any of your favorite podcast platforms. And please remember to subscribe and like us at iTunes if possible. Every like helps us keep our solid five-star rating. Cheers. <laughs>